our group. We are the largest provider of neuroscience services in, in the city and in the region. Um, and so we've got a team of wonderful providers. Um, and these specialists that you'll hear today are specializing in back pain treatment. Um, and for this presentation, you're going to hear about neck pain treatment. So we've got Dr. Joseph Amos, who's an interventional pain medicine specialist, and we've got Dr. Wesley Jones, who's a neurosurgeon, uh, and they'll tell you about neck pain, ways to treat it, uh, both non-surgical and surgical. Uh, and as Elena said, um, we'll have chat questions, um, just put your questions in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. We've got a moderator, uh, Ann Crocker, who's also on our marketing team, who will tell the physicians what all the questions are so that we can get as many answered as possible within our time frame. So Dr. Amos, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you to get us started. Thanks, Elise. Thanks everybody for joining. Hope everybody's safe during this interesting time. We're working our way through. I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. <clears throat> and then uh, thanks Mrs. Dinkin, uh, Elise, um, uh, Raquel, everyone that hands put together to, to put this together. Dr. Jones and I are really happy to present this to you today. Um, as best we can via this uh, a webinar. Uh, again, any questions, put them in the chat, any, any concerns, and we'll get them all taken care of. Any problems with the presentation, please let me know and interrupt me. Uh, we're going to go relatively quick here, and it may feel like we are uh, drinking from fire hydrant. I always put this slide in because there's a lot of information. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Jones and I are going to go relatively quickly, but don't let that intimidate you. Please uh, put questions in the chat. We're gonna present a lot of information pretty quickly so that we can save time at the end so that we can get to more pertinent questions uh, or specifics that you may wanna address. You know, when we talk about spine pain, we really talk about it uh, regionally. And obviously these, these pictures show you that it's a very complex uh, structure from the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, all the way down to the sacrum. Uh, today, we're gonna be focused on neck pain uh, when we think about the spine, you know, I think the bony structure is what, is what comes to mind the most, but, you know, for myself, and, and I speak for Dr. Jones, there's, it's a really complex array of things that are taking place in the spine. So not just the, the bony matrix or the scaffolding that it, it, it makes it up, but also um, the disc structures, the spinal cord obviously uh, is housed there and spinal nerves. So a lot of, a lot of complex, uh, interworkings of some of these microanatomy things that we deal with daily. And what that leads to is that things can go wrong. And, and that's usually when things go wrong is you'll, you would see a physician, whether it's a, a pain complaint, maybe it's numbness or tingling, maybe it's something um, that you describe in, in its own unique way, but that's usually we go to see a physician for whether it's dropping objects or even something innocuous, maybe is wrist pain. Um, and you're going to the physician to get this worked up because it's, it's cumbersome, it's, it's uh, you know, inhibiting you from doing the things you need to do, whether it's work or hobbies or leisure activities. Um, there are some red flags in, in our field that we look at that we want to get addressed immediately, that is, that, and immediately is right to the ER. You know, if you're having um, significant weakness, it, that's not something that you should wait to see the physician. If you're having new onset of uh, inability to, to hold objects, significant numbness, pain that's out of control that seem to, seems to come on without any kind of inciting event. It's something that you may need to get seen evaluated at the ER. So I want to just stress that, that if it's something that's extraordinarily concerning, we need an evaluation immediately. If that's not the case and, and the pain is more gradual or more uh, controllable, uh, the, the best thing that we do in, in a pain management um, situation is prevention. I know that's easier said than done, but prevention could be anything from better lifting technique, taking care of your body, uh, maintaining your weight, maintaining exercise so that you don't get these significant pain crisis or that when you do, they're much more manageable. And, and typically pain, whether it's a neck or low back pain, uh, the first stop that our patients usually see is their primary care physician. And they usually start the work up um, the majority of pain, believe it or not, is self-limiting, meaning it goes away on its own. Something in the neighborhood of 80% of, of pain complaints self-resolve, meaning that you may never see the physician or you may only see the primary care physician. However, in a large number of patients, that persists and continues on. And that's generally when you'd see a specialist like myself or like Dr. Jones to do a more thorough 
evaluation workup and to try to investigate what may be going on to cause those symptoms. Um, when we do our, our workup and our evaluation, it is extraordinarily thorough. It's very specific to the, the needs that we that are required to do the investigation, but it really hones in on you know, how the evolution of your pain complaint started, when it began, how it's evolved. Um, are there any other things that are involved with your past medical history? Maybe there's um, something in your family history that's a clue of what may be going on causing your ongoing pain. Um, there's a very focused neurologic examination that we do that really helps us understand what's going on um, physiologically, either in the spine or in the periphery that, that really can give us a good indication of what's going on. And then there's a lot of testing that we do, you know, MRIs, I think people are familiar with. Sometimes we get nerve studies that are neurology colleagues that we work with here um, at the UT Neurosciences, I work with very closely to just to evaluate what's going on in the soft tissue and the nerve tissue so that we can figure out what exactly may be causing the problem. Because one of the more important things that we do on our end is to our best to establish a very well understood diagnosis. Sometimes that's easy and it's straightforward and it doesn't take time at all. Sometimes that's a little bit more of a drawn out process, takes a lot more testing, takes some trial and error. But the key to, to all, everything that we do is to do our best to establish a diagnosis because then you can pair that with a very well evidence-based treatment option to get our great outcomes, which is what we're always after. And that translates to pain relief, which is what you're after, which is what we're all after. Um, a lot of the spine conditions that we see uh, span the entire spectrum of what you would, what we see in a, in a very level one academic setting that we have here in Houston, which is the largest medical center in the world. So we see everything from uh, spinal stenosis, to herniated discs, to uh, vascular injuries, to spinal tumors, um, or even peripheral nerve injuries. So we see a lot of these different conditions, which makes us well positioned to, to determine what that diagnosis may be to get you along the right treatment course. Um, treatments are, it, you know, what, the way that I see this, they're a ladder. And the bottom of the ladder is where you start more conservative. This is probably something that if you did have a painful condition and you were seeing a physician, even your primary care, um, these have become so second nature that a lot of my patients start these on their own, whether it's rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, um, depending on the condition, bracing options come into play. We very often are in close collaboration with our physical therapy associates to, to get you into a, a program to help conservatively treat some of those painful conditions that you have, but also to, to establish a home exercise program because that goes back to the prevention that we talked about earlier so that we can get the condition under control and maintain it under control for uh, years to come. Um, and then the other thing that we offer are interventional or injection uh, techniques, which is what we specialize in if some of the conservative uh, measures haven't worked or haven't been beneficial enough for your pain symptoms. Um, then there's the option of seeing a specialist like Dr. Jones to, to do something that's a much more advanced as a surgical intervention and, and that potential option if, if need be. Um, I just want to show you some, this is a very brief overview of some of the more um, common injections that we do. Epidural steroid injections are very common that we do. It's just applying the use of a steroid medication into that spinal space to try to help with some of the inflammation and pain that's going on. Uh, sometimes we utilize uh, facet joint injections, which are small spinal joints, which can be very irritated and inflamed in, uh, in, back, in neck pain and back pain. Um, and then even up to advanced options such as spinal cord stimulation, which is one of the most advanced options that we have for pain medicine. It's not for everyone, but for some of our patients who suffer from chronic, relentless, ongoing pain, it, it potentially may be. Some of the statistics on pain, I, I alluded to this earlier, you know, something about 80% of, of patients experience, experience pain, and, uh, but the majority of it's self-resolving, meaning it's going to end on its own. This is the sprain or strain that you may get over the weekend that really, um, you know, locks you up for three, four, five days, but then slowly releases, gets, gets better on its own, and you typically don't see the physician for that. 
you know, pain is a is a big in, is a big impactor of our uh, work productivity. Just because you know, when you can't you know do your work, when you can't be productive, it really impacts sort of our economy at large. And this is even you know pre-COVID numbers. So this is really something that we look at as far as getting you back and improving your function, and and getting you back to where you need to be. Uh, if you watch the news ever, you'll probably see some type of a reference or an article about opioids. There's actually the most recent one is um, uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals just got sued for $8 billion for some of the oxycodone or oxycontin things that were going on and, and led to this overuse and overprescribing uh, of opioids, which uh, unfortunately are still used for some chronic pain conditions, but we're experiencing and what we know about long-term use of opioids is they have some pretty detrimental side effects. So, you know, our philosophy here is we do absolutely everything that we can and exhaust every avenue before even considering writing opioids. And we minimize the use of opioids because we think there are better ways to do it. There are more sustainable, long-term, durable ways to treat pain that don't involve the uh, substantial use of opioids. And as you can see from some of the data, which we have now, we didn't have decades ago, we have now, we know that this isn't the um, light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of our painful conditions. Um, I think what sets us apart is, you know, obviously uh, we work together as a team and, you know, we, our title is UT Neurosciences and it is as broad as it sounds. It involves every aspect of neurosciences, whether it's from our neurology colleagues who aren't on this webinar today to our advanced surgical colleagues like Dr. Jones will speak in just a couple of minutes here uh, to myself in the pain management aspect. This collaboration really uh, just fosters a teamwork of approach to your care and make sure that every um, aspect of your care is getting coordinated with every test that we have and get you on along the right path for not only diagnosis, but also uh, treatment. Um, we, you know, always are calling and texting each other to coordinate with patient care and making sure that you get the, the top notch evidence based care that we can provide here at the largest uh, medical city in the world. Um, I think with that, we're going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jones to take over the presentation. Dr. Amos. Alina, I'm gonna text Dr. Jones and just see. What... Was he the one that had the instability on his internet? Yeah, let me check with him and see what might be happening. Okay, thank you guys for being very patient. Please continue to put your questions in the chat feature. You have some great questions. I know that we started at the very beginning, um, right at the very beginning with our first question at 101. You may be having a slight technical difficulty, so thank you guys for your patience. And if you wanted, we could do a couple of questions. It looks like he's logging back on. All right, when he logs back on, then I will. Do we wanna do a few questions while we're waiting? Yeah, let's see if we have a couple maybe for Dr. Amos. Sure. Um, one of the first ones we got is if you have pain in the scapular area, should you exercise it or rest it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a it's a broad question. Um, you know, just answering that is my mic. Did I turn back on? OK, yeah, you're good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a it's a broad question. I say from the data that I would I would sort of pull from to answer that as broadly as it is. Again, I'd love to see you and I'd love to sort of put my hands on you so I could get you a more specific answer. Rest is actually turns out not to be a great thing. You know, some 20, 30 years ago, you would 
quote unquote, throw your back out. And the, uh, this is no joke. The doctor would say, you go lay in bed for four to five days and rest your back. That was the worst advice we could give. Just, we didn't have the data at the time, but we know that immobility or, or resting, which I'm assuming is what you're asking here, is actually not a great treatment for pain because it actually turns into the muscle getting tighter, the muscle getting more sort of stiff and rigid. And then at some point you're gonna to have to break that cycle. And so if you rest it and, and allow that to sort of progress, breaking that cycle actually turns out to be a little bit more difficult and cumbersome. Um, that the one that sets that apart, I'm assuming you don't have a fracture. If you have a fracture, that's a little different. That's not something where you wanna to move too much because that's not how you treat that. That's, so that sort of falls into a different category. It sounds like you're dealing with maybe some muscular pain there. One of the ones that says I've had pain, and again, Dr. Jones interrupt me whenever he gets back online. I've had pain for many years. How do I cope with it? I think it, I think it matters what's causing your pain. You know, when, when you have um, a generic sort of diagnosis of, of just pain, it's hard to say, you know, if you've had imaging studies and we've done a lot of diagnostic testing that there's not something that's- Can y'all you know, see me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, we were just taking a couple of questions, so. Sorry about that. So that's let's okay. see if we can do this again. All right, let's try it one more time here. I'm gonna share my screen. And we will get back to the questions. So please know that we'll do that too. Okay, let's see if we can. All right, can you all see that? I see it. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Right when, right when the time came up, huh? <laughs> so I, uh, just to say, I, you know, I grew up in Belleville, Texas, which is not too far from this area. Um, grew up on a little farm there. I went to undergrad at the University of Texas. Uh, I just had to show this picture because that's about as close as I ever got to the field. And so <laughs> I tell people I played center guard and tackle, center of the bench, guard the water, tackle anybody that came near it. But uh, it was a fun time. Uh, I went to med medical school at Texas Tech in Lubbock. Um, I did my residency here at uh, UT um, downtown at Warhammer downtown and also did a infolded uh, vascular fellowship. So I do a lot of treatment with cerebrovascular disease. And then I went to Wash U uh, St. Louis um, School of Medicine uh, uh, in Barnes Jewish Hospital to do a complex spine and peripheral nerve fellowship, which is kind of what we're here for today. Um, and uh, currently uh, I'm an assistant professor with the Department of Neurosurgery at UT Health, uh, working mostly at Memorial Hermans uh, throughout the community. Um, so kind of talk about what Dr. Amos said is, uh, you know, it's a pain in the neck and, it, you know, it's a fourth leading cause of disability. Uh, low back pain, I think, is a third or second. Um, acute neck pain, you know, typically resolves spontaneously within six weeks. Most pain is not, um, you know, surgical and it will go away on its own like Dr. Amos was talking about. But, um, you know, chronic neck pain is something we define as lasting more than three months. Uh, Sixty-seven percent of adult populations will have neck pain at least one time in their life. You know, it's a, up to 31 to 55 percent incidence and 10 to 20 percent prevalence. And then, uh, you know, people that have neck pain, they've done a study that 50 percent of period people that experience neck pain will have some type of persistent pain five years later. So it could be kind of like a chronic problem if it does last um, longer than six weeks. You know, and, you know, not to go through this, but like Dr. The way I kind of think of the spine in general, but especially the cervical spine, you know, the cervical spine is probably the most complex part of your neck. Uh, of your, uh, the cervical spine is probably the most complex uh, part of your entire spine. And I think of it as a big joint, just like any joint, you know, as you get older, people talk about hip replacements, knee replacements, right? Your neck is no different. It's a complex joint. You have a lot of motion in that segment. You feel a lot of motion with your head and your neck. And so uh, all the connecting parts, the discs, the bones, the ligaments, as that all kind of deteriorates, the difference between any other joint in your body though, is it carries your spinal cord and your nerve roots. And so it, it has a lot more sensory to it. So we, even the joints itself have a lot of nerve roots and pain fibers that go to that. So when you have a little bit of degeneration at one point, you're gonna feel that a lot more than say someone than as big as a hip or a knee joint. And so I don't, you know, not that we're saying we're more important than other specialties, but obviously your neck as a joint is, is very complex and you know the, the, the stakes are high and people I think feel it a lot sooner than they would if they on a normal joint. This is to kind of show you a pic picture of an MRI and I just want you to kind of, I don't know if y'all can see my pointer, but this is just kind of show you what a little a bit of a normal MRI and we, you can see we name all these disc space in the bones for, we just count, we're very smart. We can say one, two, three, four, and we name a disc space for the spots there in between. 
But you know, one thing I kind of want you to pay attention as we go forward is here's the spinal cord. Okay, the spinal cord is very important. I tell people it's like the power plant of your certain central nervous system. And so when the spinal cord's impinged, it's not affecting just that one area, it's affecting everything downstream from that. It's affecting the whole quadrant, you know, that goes out to you know South Houston or West Houston. And you know, as we look on this side, this is like we're looking down the tunnel. We like to see this white fluid around. And at each level, at one of these levels, it sends out a nerve root. Oops, sorry. There it goes. It sends out a nerve root. And so as we send out nerve roots, that's as each nerve root branches off multiple times to send out pain fibers. As you get older, your spine degenerates, and especially at the disc spaces and the joints. And so there's all these different kind of terminology which we use, but what you can see is that it starts to degenerate, it loses its height, which narrows the hole that the nerve roots come out. The discs like to form little bones or osteophytes, we call them, or bone spurs is another fancy word. And when it does that, it pushes on the nerve roots or it pushes on the spinal cord. And that's what causes a lot of the surgical pain that we see. When you think about neck pain, it's basically made into three main categories and we don't need to go too much into this, but it's mechanical, which is mostly the muscles or the joints or the discs. It's neurological, meaning it's pushing on a nerve root or the spinal cord itself. And the two kind of terms I want you to get down is, you know, we're gonna give you a quiz at the end of this is myelopathy is, means pathology of the spinal cord and radiculopathy means pathology of the nerve root. And a lot of times those can be mixed together. Otherwise, you know, tumors, infections, like Dr. Amos said, are kind of some warning signs, and then there's trauma. And then it's some of the more kind of Italian sized things are some of the other kind of surgical things we will see, but the reds are kind of the big important ones. All right, you have to memorize this list by the end of this talk. No, but these are all the different generators of pain. And, you know, obviously this is kind of very extensive, but the, I think the main important thing to remember is these are the kind of three big things that we look for. You should see kind of a middle immediate attention and that's trauma. You know, we need a kind of acute or rapidly progressive neurological deficit. Like we were talking about weakness, progressive numbness, balance of services, bowel or bladder changes, you know, and then symptoms of infection or malignancy, which he was talking about weight loss and fevers and, and, and whatnot. So I think this kind of brings home what Dr. Amos was bringing in. And, you know, I, you know, the group that we work in is it's when we evaluate a patient for neck pain or any or spine pain or anything, it's a patient-centered multidisciplinary approach. So you have all these, the surgeon just one of the small pieces of this puzzle in that, um, you know, you see we have the radiologists that do it very important how they do their studies and interpretations of that, your community providers, your PCPs. We may send you to a neurology to get an EMG, a nerve study, to, or, or maybe something we call masquerader that's, you know, although you have neck pain, it's something actually a neurological disease that a medicine can treat. We have our pain providers like Dr. Amos, you know, Sometimes I'll say, oh, I think that this is the spot that that's the pain. I'll send you to Dr. Amos to do an injection there. And that helps not only diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic. It helps us kind of find our target, which I'll get to in ever. And then rehab and um, our physical therapy teams and occupational therapists are very essential to this. A lot of times they're in my clinic with me and we do an evaluation with the patient simultaneously, whether or not I'm going to do surgery or not. I think they're very, very uh, valuable, not only diagnosing the patient, and finding kind of musculoskeletal imbalances, but also kind of treating them and giving them a long-term approach um, to, to managing their neck pain. So I'd say surgery for neck pain, and I tell all my patients this, is we, we have to identify the target, right? And so we don't want to just go shooting a bunch of arrows and figure out where, oh, this wasn't the spot, this wasn't the spot, right? When we, when we look at surgery for neck pain, we think of it, I always say it's all got to lead to a center spot. Like where's the target of the surgery? Which the bull's at? And so we take the patient's complaints, like symptoms, their extensive history, you know, surgery before, whether or not they've had surgery, how long it's been going on, you know, can they point to a specific spot? Is there certain maneuvers we do that can kind of help elicit this? What's their exam show? The nerves kind of provide us a lot over the roadmap. So that's very helpful, makes it easy, but that's only about 20 to 30% of the time we see a specific nerve root that causes a specific area. So it also it ultimately does involve this multidisciplinary team doing this evaluation. You know, and the imaging and diagnostics can help point to the picture. Um, but ultimately, all this has to kind of lead us to a path to say, what's the target for our surgery? And so, you know, we have to take the patient's kind of problem, all our evaluations, everything together, a multidisciplinary group of specialists, spine specialists, specialists, all focused in on what's the target for our surgery. 
So one of the most kind of common surgical indications I tell people it's usually when the spinal cord is compressed, that's that myelopathy. And that's when the power plant's involved and you see everything kind of downstream being affected. When the nerve root is impinged, it's what we call radiculopathy. Usually that's a very focal treatment where you decompress that one nerve root and a lot of the pain that shoots into their arm can go away. And then obviously any kind of instability, um, which we could mean in kind of impending spinal cord injury, whether this is a trauma, infection, tumor. And a lot of teams, these all kind of coincide or work together. You can have all three, or you can have just one. It's not, it's not a none or all. And then ultimately, what are the goals of any kind of surgery we do? And I tell you, the main goal is to improve quality of life, right? So no matter what we do, that's the goal. And so, you know, if we, I can always do a surgery, but if it's not going to help you or make your life better, then there's no reason to do surgery, right? If you always have to think about the safety profile and what's the risk benefit ratio. The surgery, when we do surgery for pain, especially, the benefits must far, far outweigh the risks. And most of these surgeries we do are relatively low risk, but sometimes when they come in in an acute situation with a tumor or trauma, obviously the risks are higher, but you would say the, the benefit is essentially higher too, because the risk of not doing anything is very high. And so we always look at that profile. You know, I always think I'm an, as a neurosurgeon, we have to achieve some neurological decompression. You know, our goal is to preserve the neurological status of the patient or improve it. And then we want the treatment to be definitive and durable. You know, does it require stabilization? Meaning does it require instrumentation and infusion? If I am going to do that, I want to make sure I align the patient to the normal aging process where their ergonomics always line up into where they're doing that. This thing's hopefully they only have one surgery in their life. I don't want to have to be planning for a second surgery down the line. And, you know, there's multiple cervical spine surgeries, and I'm just going to get into a couple of these for the sake of time, especially since, you know, my computer crashed on us. But um, these are some of the more common ones we do. And obviously, sometimes we do a combination of these. We may do one, you know, here and then, you know, down the line, you may need another treatment, a different surgery. It all kind of depends. And so how do we choose what kind of surgery is? When it goes back to what's the goal, what's, what's our target, and obviously patient factors. You know, certain, certain patients have different factors, whether it be health-related factors versus, you know, lifestyle-related factors that we need to uh, kind of accommodate. And if there's a treatment, a two treatments that could potentially you know, achieve the same goal and you know this one works better for this patient then you know obviously we take that into mind and so one of the more common ones we do i'm just going to go through a couple of cases is what we call an anterior cervical discectomy infusion usually patients come in that morning they have the surgery they're home that uh afternoon um walking moving around um, but this is we make a small incision in your neck and you know we were created with these natural what we call avascular planes where if you can see on the, the picture on the left where we go in through your breathing and fitting tube to one side and your kind of your arteries and your muscles to the one other side, which is a natural plane that everybody has in their body. And it gets us right to the front of the spine. Uh, we take out the discs and right behind the discs is the nerve roots and the spinal cord. And so by removing that, we take out the spinal cord and the nerve roots. We put in a spacer. We usually put a plate to help the spine together and for the os and a bone spurs for me. As an example, uh, my clinic with progressive upper uh, extremity weakness, numbness, and tingling, having difficulty walking, difficulty holding things in both, both hands. This is a good example of what we call myelopathy. And you can see it has very one lesion. And if you look on the picture on the left, he has a white spot on his spinal cord. The power plant's being affected. And so we need to make sure to decompress that area, but it's very focal. So he underwent an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. He's doing great. His symptoms got much better. Um, you know, we've been seeing it following him for some time now. This next uh, woman is another lady with a 52 year old female that I think, you know, Dr. Amy Nash and I worked on together. They came in with some refractory uh, left arm pain that has been persistent for some time. And what you can see on the picture on the right is she has the nerve root well compressed here by a nice soft disc. And so otherwise her spine looks very, very healthy. And so, you know, we like to address the directly address the pathology. So this is a case where we did what we call an arthroplasty, which is essentially the same as a fusion, but instead of putting in, uh, infusing those spaces together, we put in an artificial disc. And this kind of just shows an example of what I was talking about, where this would be normal, but as the disc degenerates, it'll push right on that nerve root and compress the nerve root as it goes out to one side. And so she went underwent a C5-6 discectomy and arthroplasty, where we put in this artificial disc, and she's doing very, very well 
usually people have immediate relief of their, uh, of their arm pain in that case. This is another person at kind of a similar situation. Um, and he had uh, some left arm, left arm pain as well and had a disc here. You know, after, sometimes when you do the surgery in the front, you're a little bit hoarse and can be sore from swallowing. And he was a singer in his church and had a big kind of um, something to, a kind of concert coming up and so you know even though there's hoarseness there's all you know within a couple of days or weeks he just didn't want to take that chance so we did went from the back and do what we call a foramenotomy where we just basically open up the window for the from the back of the nerve root and make more room and take out the disc and reach around so um, both good options but this is a good example of treating the patient for uh, you know what 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 they needed and in, in taking into certain other factors um, this is a example of kind of a more urgent thing. This is a 58 year old female that came in with cancer. And you can see how the bone is completely destructed on this side. So she needs complete kind of reconstruction and destabilization as well as decompression of her spinal cord. So we took out that whole cancer vertebral body. We put in a special graft, plates and screws to kind of help stabilize her and realign her. She's doing well. Sometimes people come in with what we call complex, you know, deformity surgery where they have multiple two defectors. And then, you know, the workup of this involves every single uh, one of those multidisciplinary uh, specialists that I, I described, where we have to think about alignment, neurological decompression, bony fusion, stabilization, spinal cord decompression, all those factors kind of come in. And you can see here where your spinal cord is completely compressed on the um, right side there. And you know this shows from pre and post, and you know part of his problem is he couldn't even hold his head up to watch TV. So ultimately we had to achieve multiple of that by doing multiple anterior fusions, what we call osteotomies to unfuse the bone as well as posterior cervical fusion. This is a 36 year old male that came in with weakness and his inability to hold up his head. He had a syndrome called Marfan syndrome, which makes him very tall, but is also his joints very loose. He came in with a similar thing with his inability to hold up his head. And so he, he also had to undergo kind of a complex cervical reconstruction. Um, he ultimately did good. He sent me a video not too long ago of him playing basketball. Um, when he could barely kind of move his arms and hands when he came in. So that's just a few examples of kind of what we do. Um, now obviously there are kind of two different extremes of cases, but I think, you know, um, kind of the key is that m most neck pain is non-surgical, but it's important to get plugged into this, you know, multidisciplinary team of experts. Because no matter what we could always, I tell people we can treat your pain, whether or not it's surgery or not. Um, you know, patients that do have cer cervical myelopathy where it's spinal cord compressed and radiculopathy, surgery has shown uh, to have superior outcomes, you know, in conjunction with the conservative therapy, meaning that it's not all, it's not all none for surgery or not. And that, um, you know, compared to just conservative therapy alone. So when surgery is effective, it is when you define that clear target. Um, and, you know, it's very, I think it's very important when, you, when you're looking at back pain and neck pain to always be involved in a group that has a multidisciplinary team of spine experts. You know, and like in our, in our case, it, you know, a lot of times I'll be seeing a patient and I can really walk next door and you know, talk to Dr. Amos and say, hey, what do you think of this or that? Or I can do the same thing with our neurologist. Um, like I said, physical therapy a lot of time is in my clinic with me. Uh, you know, and I get their opinion and their evaluation. They may have a, a certain exam, they test they do that helps kind of pinpoint the pain spot for me better than I would. And so it's a it's, it's very inclusive environment. I think it's all patient centered for what the patient needs and that's what's important. Uh, I think this is where to find us. Um, I think y'all will get this information shared to y'all as well. Uh, thank you all. I think I guess we'll finish some questions now. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Um, and you want to go ahead and, and take questions, and then we've got contact info for our group here on the screen. So um, we can re there it is. Um, and we can reiterate that in the chat also. Perfect. Um, yeah, one of the questions that came in. Um, is are there conservative techniques to regain mobility or range in the neck? Go ahead, Dr. Amos, you want to answer that one? Yeah, you bet. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Jones. Yeah, you know, there certainly are, um, and, and that's where we start. You know, I made mention of a, a ladder. It's sort of the way that I visualize uh, treatment. So conservative being one of the bottom rungs of that. Um, you know, that generally for the cervical spine involves a lot of range of motion, you know, so chin tucks and side uh, bending just to get um, the range of motion back better. 
Um, then you'd slowly want to incorporate some resistive type exercises, resistive uh, indicating that we're trying to strengthen the muscle and the musculature around cervical spine just to help with posture. You know, the things that I would, that I see more and more now at the day and age of, you know, phones and computers and iPads is there's plenty of data that show that, you know, being too much on some of these our electronic devices, although they're integrated in, in our world now, uh, really can affect the cervical spine just from a forward head uh, flexion position. So I'd be a little bit more mindful on the preventative side. It goes back to what we were talking about to, to see if you can prevent some of those uh, painful episodes from coming up as well as treat them conservatively with the range of motion and the strengthening exercises. Great, thank you. Um, the and next I, question, oh, I go ahead, sorry. A, just, to, just, to, just to add on to that is, you know, that's, I think we're, you know, the, we, we always really work well with our physical therapy, our physiatries, even chiropractors, but they really work on muscular balance and stretching. And so, you know, the goal of the muscles is to kind of work in a, a physiological harmony with the, the spine as the joint. And so the better those muscles are stretched and strengthened, then it really helps kind of keep their typical alignment and, and you know, like Dr. Amos said, as we move forward, we, our heads are always down. We're barely looking up. And so developing a kind of routine daily exercises that, that, that can kind of prevent that is, is key. Thank you. Um, our next question was from Usha. Um, she says she has neck problems with stability when walking in places of high altitude. Do injections help with this? Yeah, I would want to get more um, history from that. You know, high, high altitude tends to, you know, Colorado comes to exam, it comes to mind because it's pretty close. Um, I have patients that, that live there and visit. That tends to be more of a, a problem, obviously, with oxygenation in the blood. So you sort of get winded, you get short of breath, um, you know, you get tired more quickly. If you're having a lot of pain that is that is very attributable to the altitude that you're in, it could be uh, at times some distension of the joint structure. The joints have capsules on them, so sometimes the joint can be changed at the altitude. It's not the most common thing that we see, but it definitely could be. Um, I would probably get a little bit more uh, clarity just on the timing, the severity, the setting of when you're having some of those painful. Is it truly something that is that is only changed by altitude or is it maybe something else that's contributing uh, but it's a great question very difficult question and I think it just needs more of a, a thorough sort of evaluation and, and questions to follow up to get more information great. so injections in general I so to the second part of your questions injections in general um, are, are sometimes hard to ju judge the efficacy or it's hard to judge how well they're affecting your pain when your pain is very intermittent. I'll give you an example. If I have a patient that say golfs on Saturday and has a little bit of back pain on Sunday, but then Monday through Friday, they're pain-free. That's a very difficult patient um, to, to judge how well an injection can do. We can do that. Uh, what we always like to see when we do our interventional techniques is the feedback or the response, like how well did the injection work? It's sometimes difficult to determine that in a patient when they have the majority of their days are pain-free. Just takes a little bit more thorough workup and a little bit more thorough evaluation. That's something that we generally treat on more of the conservative side. So with physical therapy, structural realignment, what Dr. Jones was talking about, neuromuscular education, um, we wouldn't necessarily jump to an injection in that patient simply because it'd be hard to determine your response because of the intermittent nature of those symptoms. And the other thing I would say is, you know, it's really helpful when patients kind of, sometimes they come in with like a little journal or log, especially if their symptoms are intermittent. Like what, what specifically am I doing when this happens? You know, where is it? What do I feel? You know, and then that way, when they come to the doctor, they kind of have a, a kind of a timeline and a, a, a clear report and it helps us kind of piece together a picture to know what's the next step we need to take so if someone's feeling that in specific situations you know, you know if you have your phone or a piece of paper just kind of write it down and keep some kind of log of every time it happens what do you feel where does it where does it hurt how long does it last what makes it better what makes it worse those kind of things are all kind of really you know important um, and, and really help us piece together the picture with you 
Okay, next question is, um, is chiropractic intervention a viable option? I think, you know, it has its role, you know, I, I have some chiropractors that I, I work with that are very good. You know, I, I have seen some, I think it's important to get kind of a, a thorough evaluation, maybe outside of that first, if you have, and, uh, uh, you know, problems, because, you know, sometimes there's certain things you don't want to be manipulating your neck on. Uh, so I think if you're, you're having persistent pain, I think it's important to kind of get evaluated, um, you know, kind of the thorough evaluation, physical, you know, I think chiropractor offers a lot of times a, a good, a good fix. And it's a, you know, temporizing measure. I, I think physical therapy is more of a long-term thing, um, you know, with, with the goals of, of muscular balance and stuff, but it definitely has a role. Uh, but, you know, I've seen certain things you don't want to be doing manipulating your neck. I think in low back pain, it's a little bit more liberal. There's not, the spinal cord is not there. The spinal cord ends earlier. It's more nerve roots, but it, I think it's important to get a thorough evaluation kind of before proceeding with that. But at the same time, I, I work with plenty of chiropractors who do, who do a phenomenal job and, uh, you know, it definitely has a role. Okay. Um, next question um, was from Mara. If one wants to maintain neck health and focus on prevention, are Robin McKenzie's techniques still current or are there other PT type techniques that are recommended? Thanks for the question, Mara. You know, I think that's it's a very specific question. So McKinsey techniques were first um, uh, evolved for for lumbar neuroforaminal stenosis or nerve impingement, and so it really matters on what the diagnosis is to get to that level of uh, specification on the exercises. And so it would really depend on what is going on in your cervical spine. What are your pain symptoms? Is it just a myofascial pain disorder? meaning just the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and the spine itself structurally looks good. It may not necessarily need uh, McKinsey-based exercises. The, um, the way that we do that, and a little bit to dovetail on what Dr. Jones was talking about, is seeing a, a physical therapy specialist, their job and, and the goal of that is uh, you know, quality of life, as Dr. Jones has mentioned, but also to really specialize and formulate the home exercise program to your needs, to your diagnosis, and to your abilities, right? We all have different abilities of what we're able to do and not do. And so to formulate that is the goal and the key for any physical therapy evaluation, or if you see a chiropractor, a chiropractic evaluation, um, and which I take the opportunity to, to answer the question before about chiropractor, I think there are great chiropractors um, there are bad chiropractors, there are great physical therapists, and there are bad physical therapists. But at the end of the day, what I tell my patients is they need to be addressing your problem, they need to be helping with the diagnosis, and they need to be progressing your treatment into a better situation and developing a home exercise program. It shouldn't be an, an episode where you need to come back every month for 12 months for the rest of your life, because that's not a sustainable sort of cure or toward, moving towards a fix for your problem. Um, but the same goes with this type of exercise. We would have to hone it in and individualize it based on your diagnosis and the pain symptoms that are going on. That, just to kind of bring home that point, that's, you know, one thing I always tell patients is, you know, physical therapy or chiropractor, it's like college or like, you know, school. You, you're not getting any kind of, you're going to get some treatment there with maybe some special machine, machines, but ultimately when you're there, you should be getting this kind of, what's my, every hour where I go is four to five hours of work at home at least, you know? And so what's my kind of long-term goal? What's my home plan and specific tailored to me, you know? And so that's, that's the appropriate way to use physical therapy. Not, Oh, I went three, you know, three sessions a week and then it didn't do anything for me. Well, that, that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking kind of for a long-term balance kind of goal and specific patient specific treatment evaluation. And I, and I think the, the physical therapists, you know, I've worked with have been phenomenal at that. So. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Kirk and it says, um, can an MRI be misleading? What if the neurologist cannot believe that the patient's function is perfect? Infusion was recommended and the patient declined five years ago. No more episodes of, of radicular pain. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would say um, like that, you know, there's plenty of people walking, like I said, everybody's, if you take an MRI of anybody past 30, 
of the joints in people's bodies, they're going to be worn out. Okay. So not everybody that has a worn out, um, you know, disc or joint or some, I've seen people walking around that get an MRI of their neck for some other reason and they're no neck pain, no symptoms at all for some, you know, and it all kind of depends, you know, if there's spinal cord compression, right. And there's evidence of that on the imaging. That's someone I watch really close. Now, if there's not, then, you know, So the patient doesn't have a so that's where we usually trial conservative therapy if they have just one episode and then if that uh, gets better then um, we'll go from there okay okay we have one last question um, from Alma um, is it considered chronic pain if it's not every day but recurring from time to time you know, the definition of chronic pain is um, if, it, if it's a, a painful episode that lasts more than three months, some, some of our societies say up to six months, but I think we all sort of agree up to three months, you know, so if it happens and resolves and doesn't come back for an extended period of time, so you have a, a painful episode for five or six days, goes away and six months later, then you have another painful episode. You know, I think that doesn't fall in the criteria of what we all use and the, what the textbooks say, but from a, from a pragmatic point of view, it definitely does sort of constitute chronic pain. The one thing that I would say is, if it, is it the same thing that's going on? Is it the same pain or is it maybe a different episode of a different pain generator? That may change that answer, but I think overall getting it evaluated and making sure that structurally things are okay is the first way to start. And I wanted to I wanted to jump in here. I'm sorry. I saw one question. I apologize. I may go over just a little bit. Um, I saw one question. I wanted to address it um, up up at the top. And I think we started earlier. I've had pain in my neck for many years. How do I cope with it? And I think what your question really is. I want to use it as a springboard. Is that you know this unfortunate webinar is a little time limited. One of the things we didn't focus on and that we we talk about a lot in pain medicine is the psychological aspect of pain whether it's psychosocial functioning, whether it's functioning as a, of a productive member of, in our um, community, in our society. So getting mental help for pain, and, and I think this is maybe what this question goes to, because when I, when I say, when I see cope with it, it seems like it's more of it's uh, having a depressive effect, maybe making anxiety, making other, maybe mental health very difficult to deal with. And so we, we facilitate that as well. We didn't touch on that, but I wanted to use this as um, an opportunity to say that the mental health aspect of chronic pain is sometimes just as important as prescribing a medication as doing an injection or doing a surgery. And so we take that into account when we, when we evaluate the patient and we treat them comprehensively. So um, if you're having difficulty coping with your pain, there are techniques. We usually employ psychiatry, psychology. There's you know meditation that can be very beneficial, acupuncture, body scanning techniques, cognitive behavioral therapy. I know I'm going really quick here because I'm trying to get a bunch of stuff in, but there are mental health components that we implore in chronic pain management. And, and this uh, un individual may be beneficial for some of that. And so that's another aspect that gets very comprehensive, but is, is attached to chronic pain management that's outside of physicality. Great, great. Um, I think we are towards the end. This was excellent. I really appreciate both Dr. Jones and Dr. Amos taking the time to uh, come here. We do have in the chat feature how that you can get a hold of them. Um, I will also remind everybody that on Thursday we have another presentation, bulging disc pinch nerves and sciatica. So if it's not one thing, it's another. But you know what? The UT will will take care of your body from head to toe. Um, in closing, would either of you doctors like to say anything, or Elise, would you like to say anything? Elena, I wanted to to point out. So I put in the in the chat one more time our contact info. Our website is on there too. Um, there was a question about we have uh, specialists from our group at UTMB and Webster, and we're separate from UTMB, so we don't have specialists over there. Uh, we do have um, a clinic in Southeast Houston near Memorial Hermann Southeast. 
Um, so that might be a closer um, clinic to, to this person, but Overall, just look at our website and you can see all of our different locations. These two physicians are in Memorial City and Katy, uh, and obviously they'd be um, a great help for a variety of conditions. Great, great, great. Thank well, you all thank for having us. Absolutely, Dr. Amos, Dr. Jones, all of y'all today. Um, we're very fortunate to have this relationship. We will continue it and everybody stay safe. Thank, thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye everybody.